Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back once again to Vrax. Last time we had ourselves some political machinations and backstabbing, which cost Lord Hector Rex a full Lion Corps, a full Assault Corps, a full Bombardment Corps, and seven companies of independent artillery. A heavy blow, no doubt, and one that required a great deal of reshuffling of the front lines. And the lucky formation chosen to take the place of the 1st Line Corps was the 12th Line Corps, with the 143rd Regiment being detailed to carry out the assault upon Gate 579459. I am sure the men of the 143rd were excited to take on this almost impossible task, and I'm sure they were equally delighted to know that Lord Hector X had re-examined his plans, and had decided to request that the Titans of Legua Storum provide fire support for the 143rd. The Titans would still not actually advance to the walls and engage them at close range, but they would at the very least fire upon the walls and the gatehouse at maximum range. Better than nothing, I suppose. The 143rd would also enjoy the assistance of tank companies under the command of Commissar General Maug, along with the additional artillery support rerouted from other line corps uh, to support the effort. With the drastic drop in available artillery pieces, the rest had to be scrounged and stolen from any and all other formations that were not in immediate need of them. And considering the nature of the target the 143rd was set to attack, they were going to need every bit of firepower the Inquisitor Lord could scrounge up for them. The hope was that by concentrating so much firepower in one area, they would be able to simply blow the enemy away entirely. Sounds like an uh, oddly familiar plan. I wonder if it'll work out this time. Spoiler alert. No, it, no, 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 it, no, no, just, just no, no. And so the 143rd had to attack the gates, just like usual. They were supported by long-range firepower from the Titans, the Reaver classes in particular using their Apocalypse missile batteries to pound the gates. This did have some effect. The enemy decided that they could not simply stand around and allow the enemy to charge the gates and then repel them, utilizing the various weaponries built into the citadel walls, as they had done so many times before. The standard procedure at the first breach was that the defenders would only launch massed counterattacks when they had no further options. Counterattacks were used to throw the Death Corps out of the breach. They were never used to stop the Death Corps from entering it entirely. This was due to the simple fact that if a large Varaxian formation was to exit their fortifications, they would become little more than so many easy targets for the Death Corps' artillery. And so, operating on the assumption that this assault would be no different, Commissar General Maug ordered his tanks to advance alongside the infantry with their guns at maximum elevation to suppress any weapons inside the walls and on top of them. In this manner, the 143rd and its supporting elements moved towards the gate, suppressing the enemy as they went, until they would get close enough to begin attacking the gate directly. It was hoped that the combined firepower of the armoured elements alongside the titans would be enough to collapse the massive gates. But as the Commissar General's Lehman Rush tank ground ever closer, he could see something that was unusual. The Commissar General swore he could see beams of light beginning to spill out from the gates. That was not supposed to be happening. The gates had been designed to be virtually impenetrable edifices, and there were no gaps or openings of any sort. Nothing that could possibly weaken the structure of the armoured gates. The only possible explanation then was that the gates were opening. As he reached for his Vox speed to communicate this to the rest of the assault force, 
The Commissar General's Lehman Ross took a hit that smashed straight through the armoured front plates of the vehicle. Maug immediately and instinctively hit the release button on his armoured hatch, blowing it open. He threw himself out of the vehicle seconds before fire gutted the Lehman Ross tank. As he jumped clear of the vehicle by leaping off the armoured tracks, the tank's turret exploded, the fire having cooked off a shell that was already in the chamber. The shattered turret sent shrapnel flying in all directions, and one piece of shrapnel caught the Commissar General right between the shoulder blades. The flak armour he always wore beneath his greatcoat had saved his life, but the impact had knocked the wind clean out of him. After attempting to call out for aid, the Commissar General fell unconscious. But even without him, the battle carried on, and his observation had been correct. The enemy had decided to change the playbook, because this was not a manoeuvre approved by the Cardinal or his command staff. This was Zufour through and through, and coming storming out of the slowly opening gate was a massive armoured spearhead of Chaos Space Marines, mounted in rhinos and land raiders escorted by predators and vindicators. But the Skulltaker's warband also brought with them entirely new weapons, previously unseen on Vrax. The Sanctified had already begun the process of weakening the veil between the worlds, in preparations for calling in their Infernal Master's favoured servants into the mortal realm. This is a long and torturous process. It is not easy to breach the walls of reality, and even less easy to do so in a fashion that is relatively controlled. Any mistake at this point would cost the sorcerer casting the spell his life, if he was lucky. If he was unlucky, it would reduce him to a mewling, mindless, wretched creature, constantly having his body racked by never-ending mutations. A chaos spawn. But even at this early point in the process, there were benefits to be had from weakening the veil. It made it possible for weaker demonic entities that usually would be unable to survive in the material realm for any period of time to possess pre-prepared hosts. These hosts usually took the form of mechanical monstrosities, like the Blood Slaughterer or the Defiler Walking Tank. These mechanical chassis are at a fundamental level operational. All of the joints move and there is a engine of sorts. There is also a way to pass energy throughout the various limbs that drive the thing forward. However, in our reality, they simply would not function. Their distribution of weight might, for example, be uneven, or they may balance on absurdly thin legs that would simply sink into the soil, or they may simply be too heavy, unable to lift themselves off the ground whilst powered by such a relatively small engine. All manners of various complications that would make these machines quite literally impossible all go flying right out the window when they are possessed by a demonic entity. Suddenly, many of the rules and regulations of our material universe cease to apply. Not in any extraordinarily drastic fashion, it's not like the machines can suddenly fly if not equipped with turbines of some sort, for example, but they will be able to bend the laws of reality in a limited fashion. And these impossible demon machines were leading the charge of Sephora's armoured spearhead. A massive herd of demon engines were hurtling towards the 143rd advancing lines. The machines of the Death Corps had been ordered to keep their weapons elevated, to fire up at the parapets and the wall-mounted guns. It would take them precious seconds to lower their aim, and that was all the time in the world for these demon engines to close. They turned the lead elements of the 143rd into so much shredded metal and blood. And under the cover of this ferocious assault, the Skulltakers deployed from their transports, 
So Ford himself, clad in massive, hulking, ancient dreadnought armour, striding out of his personal Land Raider, followed by his Terminator elite bodyguard. Alongside the Skull Takers, the Black Brethren of Arius also deployed their own armoured fist formations, and the Iron Warriors too deployed their own Predators and Land Raiders. Having so far remained content at occupying their own area of the walls, the Iron Warriors had clearly fallen in with Sufor. Not that they had much of a choice, I imagine. They were now being deployed actively in a more offensive manner. Something that surely irked the Warlord of the Steel Brethren. For him, an Iron Warrior, to take instructions in siegecraft from a cornered berserker must have rankled quite deeply. But, on the other hand, most would argue that it is better to take orders from such a man than to be a skull mounted atop his trophy rack. And regardless of their motivations for doing so, all the various warbands on the planet were now united uh, under Zufor, and in this counter-offensive. Even the Plague Marines had sent an armoured spearhead made up of the Lords of Decay to show their uh, fealty to Zephor, and to ensure the cornered warlord that they had heard nothing of any deacon fleeing to their lines. And if they were to discover any uh, imperial deacons of a uh, human nature amongst them, they would of course let Zephor know the very moment that they discovered such a... Uh, Abomination. Whether or not Sufor truly believed them, well, that is an entirely immaterial question. For now, all of the various warbands were united under his command, and he was employing them as effectively as could be expected against the 143rd, who was the first formation unlucky enough to be exposed to the full fury of a unified Chaos Force. The battle continued to rage for the rest of the day, with the Death Corps pouring in additional reinforcements to stimmy the Chaos Advance, which had shattered the leading elements of the 143rd and pushed deep into the middle of the formation. But they could not drive the Chaos Forces back. Unusually, the battle also lasted a bit into the early hours of the night, with the Chaos Space Marines being able to operate during low-light conditions with very little, if any, loss in efficiency. The 143rd had never even made it close to the gate, and they had received a monstrous mauling in the process, including the loss of the leader of the tank forces. Commissar General Maug was never heard from again. But the operation had produced one piece of astonishingly good luck. When the gates were being drawn open to allow the Chaos counterattack to exit, the barrage upon it from the Titans in support had not lessened. Their range had been too long and their aim too high to truly have a decisive impact upon the Chaos forces leaving the gate and by the time the Titans were able to readjust their weaponry, it was all too late, as the Chaos Spearhead was already in amongst the 143rd. But, by the time it took for the gates to open and the Chaos Forces to exit and the Titans to realign their weapons, one Titan had landed an exceedingly lucky shot. An extreme range melter blast from the Reaver class Titan Asus Ultra had struck the joint mechanism of the massive armored gate, fusing it shut into a massive piece of molten metal, holding the gates open for the entire barrage. In and of itself, it was not necessarily a fatal blow to the gatehouse structure. If given enough time, work crews could be sent up there to blow off and destroy the joint entirely, allowing the gate to slowly and cautiously grind shut on its remaining two joints. But as it was, the gate was now locked open while the Titans continued to pour firepower into both the gate and, far more importantly, the gatehouse itself. The gatehouse was designed to interlock with the massive armoured doors, 
which would allow the entire massive structure to move and flex as one to dissipate the energy of repeated blasts of enemy weapon fire. This combination made the gatehouse supremely resistant to incoming fire and would allow it to stand up to even the heaviest of bombardment for an incredible amount of time, but it was also very much so a case of each individual piece being weaker whilst on its own, whilst stronger combined. And bereft of the support of the armoured gates themselves, the gatehouse proved surprisingly fragile. The massive edifice began to show cracks in its permacrete structure, and one of the gatehouse towers collapsed. Once this was noticed by the weapon moderati on Asus Ultra, he immediately reported the fact to his Principe, who sent the observation further up the chain of command to High Principe Drauker, who immediately ordered all titans to refocus their weaponry on the gatehouse itself who was then subjected to an hour-long bombardment from every Titan-class weaponry available, and slowly but surely, the massive gatehouse began to crumble more and more until it finally collapsed in a giant pile of rubble. Both of the gatehouse towers had disappeared, and the massive armoured doors had been buried beneath thousands of tons of permacrete. By the actions of Sephora, and the will and blessing of the Emperor, the gate had been breached. Not that it helped the 143rd much, as they were forced to retreat from the battlefield at the end of the day, having been unable to regain the ground lost to the Chaos counterattack, and completely unable to approach the new breach itself. As for the Chaos forces who had sallied out from it, they now found themselves in a bit of a pickle as well. It was primarily an armoured spearhead that had exited the gate, the gate that was now little more than a giant pile of rubble. And as the battle began to peter out with the oncoming darkness, the Death Corps forces pulled back to their own trench lines. They would have to fight running skirmishes against Chaos Space Marines for most of the night. This forced the Death Corps artillery to concentrate a fair bit of their efforts on blocking barrages in front of their own trench lines. Clearly a part of the Chaos Force's plan, since every other gun available was still hammering loose at the breach point. To attempt to make it as difficult as possible for the Chaos Forces to extract their armour from the wrong side of the gate. Unfortunately, the Chaos Armoured elements proved resilient and by the next morning, with the exception of the occasional abandoned wreckage, there was no sign of the armoured spearhead outside of the walls. On the one hand, Zufor's bold and highly unorthodox counterattack had completely shattered the advance of the 143rd. On the other, he had also got his troops stuck on the wrong side of the gate which had brought a considerable element of risk into the operation. If the 88th had had a substantial formation of Astartes forces in reserve from amongst the Red Hunters, or if they had deployed their Grey Knights, which one may ask oneself why they chose not to deploy, then the Chaos Space Marines could have found themselves in an exceptionally sticky situation with virtually the entirety of Vax's Chaos Space Marine forces, including a vast proportion of their armour, along with their leader Sufor, all stuck outside of the walls, with no easy line of retreat. The God Emperor had surely smiled upon Lord Hector Rex and the 88th when he guided that one lucky melter blast towards a joint in the massive armoured doors. But the ruinous powers had smiled equally kindly upon Zephor by ensuring that the 88th and Lord Hector Rex did not realise just what a precarious position his enemies had put themselves in. This had been an opportunity to end the war on Vrax once and for all. Without Zephor, without the Chaos Space Marines, the dissolutioned and already collapsing elements of the Vraxian PDF and Labor Auxilia would almost certainly have broken and given up the fight right then and there. 
But it was not to be. Zephor was allowed to escape, although even he must have recognized just how close and just how risky his operation had been. This was intended to be a show of strength, a demonstration of his ability as a leader, and he certainly could claim at the very least a technical success, and I am sure that he would trumpet it as such to any who would listen, but I am not entirely convinced that his position as leader was strengthened by this. And on the second day of the battle for the now breached gate, there was no further large-scale chaos counterattacks. The Chaos Space Marine, now reinforced with Vraxian defense forces, were dug in and defending the breach in much the same way that they had done the previous one. The 143rd made another series of attempts on the second day, but none were overly successful. They continued their attempts on the third day, but once again without much in the way of success. And after the heavy casualties suffered on the first day, the 143rd was now completely spent. Lord Hector Rex, however, was not willing to give up the attempt on the breach yet. He had to make the most out of it. It had been a stroke of exceptional fortune to have the gate breach as easily as it had been, and it had to be taken advantage of. And so, instead of the 143rd, the 149th Regiment would be sent in in their stead. This time, they would also receive the direct support of the Titans, along with the Red Hunters, Space Marines, and Inquisitorial representatives. The gates would be taken this time. The battle plan was, characteristically of Lord Hector Rex, very straightforward. The Red Hunters would bring up their own armor, Predators, Land Raiders, and Rhinos. And in addition to carrying forward the Red Hunters, these transports would also be used to carry the Inquisitors, their retinues, and stormtroopers. The assault would be preceded by a massive artillery bombardment from all available guns of the Death Corps and from the Titans. Then, alongside the Titans, the Red Hunters and their Inquisitorial allies would make a dash for the Gate Rubble. Serving as the battering ram, they would take the breach and then be followed in by the 149th Siege Regiment, who would spill in through the curtain walls and secure the other side. Then, the artillery batteries would be moved up and be put in position to prepare defensive barrages to stop any enemy counterattack. And finally, engineering elements would be brought up to clear out the rubble of the gatehouse and make it passable for Imperial armor. It promised to be yet another costly operation, but the addition of the Red Hunters deployed for the first time in force might just be enough to tip the scale. Previously, the Red Hunters had been deployed as the personal bodyguards of various Inquisitors, and the Inquisitors themselves had only been deployed in a very scattered and unfocused nature, with each Inquisitor determining when, where, and how he and his entourage was to fight. And finally, of course, there was the Grey Knights, who were still kept in reserve aboard their own ship high above in orbit. They had not yet found it necessary to deploy, and if the cornered warlords of four and virtually all of the Chaos Space Marines within the Varaxian Citadel was not considered worthy of their attention, one may almost be forgiven for wondering what would be considered worthy. Only almost, though, mind you, doubting the God Emperor's most favoured servant in the Grey Knights is obviously an action punishable by swift and immediate execution, so don't even think about it. And now that we are all clear about the infallibility of the Grey Knights, let's move on to the assault. The Titans, and all available independent artillery companies, as well as the gun of the 12th Line Corps, all open up on the breach. Whilst the barrage was still partially ongoing, the Red Hunter's armoured spearhead began to rush towards the breach. 
the enemy immediately responded with a withering hail of anti-tank fire. And as the spearhead closed, the artillery shifted from high explosive rounds to smoke rounds, shrouding the front line in a thick, heavy pail of smoke. The inquisitorial tanks and Red Hunter's armoured elements also fired off their own smoke launchers, and then continued to drive through the fog as fast as they could. Once they reached the bottom of the breach, they disgorged their assault elements, which immediately began rushing up the slope where they met surprisingly weak enemy resistance. The breach was held primarily by mortal resistance, and the Red Hunters and the Inquisitors made short work of them. They approached the top of the breach, and they had yet to encounter any serious resistance. There was a momentary fear that the enemy may have undermined the breach as they had done previously, but it was believed to be impossible for the Vraxians to have prepared a countermine in such a short period of time. Nevertheless, it seemed very suspicious that the enemy would surrender such a vital breach point with so little resistance. A massed counterattack was feared, but, well, those were always a constant danger, and there was nothing that the Inquisitors or the Red Hunters could do about that. Once they reached the top of the breach, they called in the rest of the assault force, and the men of the 149th Siege Regiment swiftly began their own march across No Man's Land into the still hammering defensive fire from the curtain walls. They would push past the Red Hunters and establish a security cordon while the Inquisitors and the Space Marines move up to and through the curtain walls, clearing out any further defensive measures. Or at least so was the plan, but then suddenly, the Inquisitors and the Ristati's allies had something considerably more pressing to occupy their minds. For they had walked straight into Zephor's trap. Zephor was more than aware that his previous showing had not necessarily impressed the other warlords, uh, and had not led to the gains that he may have promised them. And so, instead, he had decided to demonstrate his long-term plan in a slightly more limited fashion. He knew that the Imperium would continue to attack the breach, and all he needed was a little bit of time to prepare his surprise. And whilst his Chaos Space Marines held the breach, the Sanctified prepared an altar beneath it, preparing to open up a small warp rift right in the middle of it. And once set up, all it would need to activate was a bit of blood and a bit of slaughter. Something the Inquisition and the Red Hunters readily provided as they cut their way through the defenders. What came next, however, was going to be considerably more difficult to cut through. As the Imperial forces reached the top of the breach, and began preparations for seeing off any incoming Vraxian counterattacks, they laid eyes for the first time upon the Vraxian main citadel. They could see its defences, its multiple walls and massive armoured gates all of its own, overlooking a huge open killing ground studded with further enemy defences. It would still be a hard nut to crack even when the curtain walls were breached, but, with the taking of this second breach, there were now two entrances past the citadel walls. This would in all due likelihood force the enemy to retreat within their last holdfast, or stand and be annihilated slowly from two directions as the Imperial forces pushed down the curtain walls. Such were the thoughts that were passing through the Inquisitor's minds uh, as they looked upon the battlefield that was soon to be covered by the advanced elements of the 419th. But then, flickering ever so slightly off in the middle distance, there was a patch of discoloured light, as if the air itself was changing colour and consistency and a smell like curdled milk wafted over the advance parties. Moments thereafter, the slightly discoloured patch of air began to tear open, to grow, and stranger colours began skipping through. Colours that had never before been seen in the material universe by mortal eyes. And swiftly behind those colours came a horde of demonic creatures, of corn and of Nurgle. 
Simultaneously with the demonic assault, the second phase of Zufor's plan also was set in motion. Swarms of blight drones that had been hiding behind the curtain walls and just on top of them, out of sight, now began swooping down upon the Imperial lead elements. The impossibly slow and lazy chop 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 of their rotors as they descended, making it sound as if an unbelievably large swarm of flies was slowly converging upon the breach. Soon they began chattering full automatic fire down upon the Imperial defenders, who were desperately trying to get into cover. And from the bottom of the reverse slope on the Varaxian side, the Inquisitors spotted huge, hulking, and yet strangely spindly beasts rushing up towards them. Corn blood slaughterers, the very same type of demonic machine that had led Zufor's initial counterattack. They were storming up the breach with unnatural speed, their impossibly spindly legs carrying them forward over broken terrain as if it was flat ground. And within moments, they slammed into the Red Hunter's line. The Astartes had been suppressed by the Blight Drones and had been unable to bring their weaponry to bear against the advancing enemy, who were now in amongst them, cleaving, cutting and massacring the Space Marines. Only the powered weapons of their champions or the Inquisitors stood much in the way of chance of taking down these mechanical beasts in melee. Otherwise, the heavy weapons of the chapter would have to draw a bead upon the creatures as they rampaged and raved in melee combat. A difficult feat even for an Adeptus Astartes. And the moment the Devastator Marines locked the leg plates of their armour to steady them, they would be showered in a storm of rounds from the Blight Drones hovering above. And this was but the diversion. The Blight Drones and the Blood Slaughterers were there to hinder the Space Marines in engaging the true threat that was streaming up the reverse slope, and was soon in amongst them. Demonic creatures, bloodletters, and plague bearers. Demonic entities conjured forth from the darkest, deepest reaches of the warp. The Red Hunters began to buckle and may even have broken under the pressure, but their inquisitorial allies proved that they were more than just the God Emperor's inquisitors. They were also fighters of near unparalleled quality. Armoured in some of the finest protection the Imperium could provide, and armed with a huge and wide variety of exotic, rare and powerful weaponry, they were able to engage the blood slaughterers in close combat with great effect as each Inquisitor and man in his retinue was almost certainly armed with a variety of powered weaponry that laughed at any enemy's armoured protection. And the retinues of many Inquisitors also contained men and women that were specialised in fighting demons. Battle sisters of the Adeptus Sororitas, psychers with a special affinity for banishing demons, and tempestuous stormtroopers who had seen and killed everything the galaxy could throw at them. For once, it was the mortals that provided rescue for the mighty Adeptus Astartes, as the Red Hunters operating primarily as bodyguard formations for the various Inquisitors rallied around them and their retinues, forming armed and armoured redoubts that resisted the oncoming tide of fiendish devilry. But even these armoured islands in the middle of the horde of demons would inevitably eventually be overrun. But just as it looked as if their brave resistance was at an end, scything hails of lasgun fire began cutting into the horde surrounding them. Hundreds of hellguns, firing as quickly as their operators could pull the trigger, were sending searing beams of light cutting through the demonic hordes, as the Death Corps grenadiers cleared their eyes and immediately began rushing into close combat with the demons. Any other Imperial Guard army would at the very least have hesitated for a moment before throwing themselves into this seething sea of monstrosities. But the Death Corps, demonstrating their complete lack of fear and determination, simply marched on, as if against any other enemy. Their sheer weight of numbers and the firepower they brought with them slowly but surely began to turn the tide. 
The Inquisitors and the Red Hunters took this opportunity to reorganize, withdrawing just a single step behind the charging Death Corps Grenadiers and leveling their own, more destructive weapons over their heads, letting fly with bolters and heavy weapon rounds, throwing back the enemy yet further with a second volley of devastating firepower. And along with the Death Corps Grenadiers also came their own heavy weapons. Missile launchers were setting up and sending frag missile after frag missile, firing off into the horde. Heavy bolters were chattering and autocannon sent out a heavy thud 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 fire rate, blasting even demons apart. The hell-spawned warp creatures were disappearing at such a rate that it was unsustainable. The rift was small and freshly born into this world, the demons fleeing back through it as their essences were torn away from their material bodies as they were destroyed, overloaded it, and it collapsed in on itself, cutting the demons off from any further reinforcements and weakening those still on the material realm. They had minutes at best before they too were tossed back into the warp, but they intended to make the most of it. Redoubling their efforts and fueled by the fact that this was their last chance to gorge themselves on the flesh and blood of the living, the demons surged forward once again, and horrifically brutal close quarter fighting soon developed. The minutes must have seemed like hours for the Inquisitors and the men of the Death Corps of Krieg. To the Red Hunters, it must of course just have been another Sunday afternoon, but for the mere mortals, it must truly have been hell. But as the final monstrosity was banished back into the warp, and the final blood slaughter was pounded into so much scrap metal by heavy bolter fire, the Death Corps, Red Hunters and Inquisitors stood triumphant over the breach. They had taken the gatehouse. Although it wasn't much of a gatehouse yet. Heavy artillery elements would now be brought forward and the engineers would begin working. They would work throughout the night to clear as much of a passage through it as possible and heavy armor would be flowing through it hopefully by the next morning. Lord Hector X would be pleased to learn that the bridge had been taken and that it could now be expanded upon by armored elements. He would be considerably less pleased, however, to hear that there were demons about. And he would be even less pleased to hear that the warp rift at the breach had not been the only one. In fact, there had been a second ritual carried out as well in the Nurgle infested areas, aimed towards the 30th Line Corps still holding the southern front. The worshippers of Nurgle had aimed to bring a great unclean one into the material realm, using the fighting to draw power into their own inhuman ritual, and they had succeeded. Fortunately for Lord Inquisitor Hector Rex, he did not have to worry over much about the great unclean one. Such a monster could have wrecked untold havoc upon the 30th Line Corps, bringing with it, as it did, a myriad of horrifying and near unstoppable diseases. It would be a true greater demon of Nurgle, and not a small, minor manifestation, like the one that had infected the moon and elevated him to demon prince status. This thing alone might very well have punched a hole clean through the 30th Line Corps, and may have caused no end of problems in the rearward lines. But this was also the reason why the Grey Knights had remained in reserve. They had struck upon the Greater Demon the moment the ritual was detected, teleporting several of their squads directly on top of the ritual site, slaughtering the cultists and massacring the sorcerers. They had not acted quickly enough to prevent the summoning of the monster, however, but it was fresh, weak and new to this material universe and the Grey Knights managed to overcome it as well. Or at least, that was the short, low-on-detail version presented to the Lord Inquisitor. The Grey Knights were a secretive lot, not fond of discussing their operations even with the Inquisition, and Hector Rex suspected that this particular engagement had not gone quite as well 
as the communique may suggest, because he noted that Brother Captain Stern had requested reinforcements from Titan. Yet another vessel would be dispatched from the Grey Knight's base, containing a second strike force under the command of Brother Captain Arturus. This was a doubling of the Grey Knight's presence in system, and wherever the Grey Knights feel it necessary to ask for reinforcements, that is a place no sane human would like to stay. And so, naturally, this news was quite disturbing for Rex. He had anticipated this, in fact, it was the reason why he had argued for the 88th inclusion within the Order Malice to begin with. It was precisely to avoid Vrax turning into a hellhole playpen for the Demons of Chaos, but he had hoped he still had had a bit of time. He had hoped to prevent this entirely, and he had thought that the Vraxians under the command of the Cardinal, as Hector Rex was as of yet unaware of the Cardinal's demise, did not have the necessary knowledge or the desperation required to summon the Demons of Chaos. And he may have been correct. The Cardinal's followers and his command staff would not have had the information and probably not the inclination either to fully submit themselves to forces that they knew so little of, especially considering their previous alignment. But Sephor and his worshippers, however, that was an entirely different thing indeed. To try and get to the bottom of this, Hector Rex gave orders to his old mentor, Thor Malkin, to begin an investigation into the warp rift, to try and determine who or what had created it, and whether or not the Chaos Forces might be able to replicate it, and if they could, on what scale. After all, the warp rift that had manifested at the ruins of the gatehouse had been small and weak, and had been overcome fairly easily by the Red Hunters, the Death Corps, and the Inquisitors. The Grey Knights had held squads in reserve in case they had to intervene, but they had not been forced to. At least not according to the official records. Unofficially. Maybe a different case. After all, the Warp Rift was overcome unusually swiftly, even for such a young tear. As for the Greater Demon, it had required a huge concentration of power and sacrifice. It was not something the worshippers of Nurgle could pull off again, at the very least, not any time soon. And so, the biggest threat appeared to have already passed. But then there was also the case of the Grey Knight reinforcements. The Grey Knights are few and far between, and they know it. They are fully aware that they are the last line of defence, a gossamer-thin shield against the threat of the warp, and they would never deploy two full strike groups unless they thought it was absolutely necessary. And well, the Grey Knights tend to be quite expert when it comes to the nature of demons. If they thought it was necessary, then clearly the Inquisitors had missed something. But Hector Rex's old mentor was one of the most knowledgeable Inquisitors in the entire sector. If anyone could get to the bottom of it, it was undoubtedly him. It would, however, take some time. Before then, Lord Hector Rex had another offensive to plan. Now that the Twelfth had finished the job that the First had started, there were two breaches in the Citadel walls and all that stood between the 88th and final victory was the last Vraxian Citadel. The other curtain walls would also have to be breached, but now they could be attacked from behind and the sides as well. It would still require a big cleaning up operation, but the fall of the curtain walls were now all but guaranteed. And with the fall of the Citadel walls, this would also bring with it the destruction or capture of the various laser defense batteries and missile silos on the planet. There was but a few installed within the Citadel itself. 
this would allow the Imperial Navy to operate above Vrax for the first time with almost complete impunity. It was even considered that the war could be ended now, finally, with a prolonged orbital bombardment. The Citadel itself was still protected by a Void Shield generator, and it was the single most powerful of its kind on the entire planet, stemming all the way back to the original settlement of the world. It would take a long time indeed, even with the mighty firepower of an Imperial fleet, to breach it. And of course, the bombardment could not be started immediately, regardless. The entirety of the 88th would first have to be withdrawn to a safe distance, which would take months at best, and possibly as much as half a year at worst. And during all that time, the Chaos Renegades would be able to do God Emperor only knows what. If given several more weeks, and possibly months, it was a real possibility that the war on Vrax could still be lost. And that was simply not acceptable. The 88 had come much too far, and sacrificed far too much to face defeat now. And Lord Hector Rex had bet his entire career on this victory. There was no one on the Imperial side that would give the Chaos Heretics the time they needed to prepare. They would breach the remaining curtain walls, they would surround the Citadel, and they would grind it to dust like they had done every other impediment before them. And for the first assault upon the final Citadel, you will have to wait until next week. Until then, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.